First question for you, is this a little over the top? <laughs> um, so this is a map running from R, and we're looking at 7,000 or so coordinates. Each coordinate has a weight associated with it, and they're aggregated together into those, those squares, and the color represents the sum of the weights for all those coordinates in those squares. And R is updating those weights every 100 milliseconds, and the website is updating accordingly. So my talk is pretty much why I've done this. Um, and like Niall this morning, I'm going to tell you a story. But I borrowed my introduction from another well-known introduction to story, but I think I've hidden it quite well. I don't know if you'll spot it. So in the beginning, Joe created Leaflet. <laughs> Hold that thought. Um, and Joe said, let there be features. And there were features. Now, Joe Chang at RStudio didn't create Leaflet. He created the R package Leaflet, which lets you plot Leaflet maps from R directly. And you can do this through another package, what's called HTML widgets, which lets you combine JavaScript and R code into a single package. So you can do all your data work in R and plot JavaScript plots directly. Now, a year or so after this was released, I also had a package out which interfaced Google Maps' API, so all the geocoding services, the directions API, the distances API. And I thought, well, given that a Google Map itself is just a JavaScript library, can I build a Google Map widget? Short answer, yes, I can. I released it in uh, May 2017. That's a screenshot of it, uh, the Google Map within RStudio. So fast forwarding from 2017 to this year, I gave a talk at the R Users Conference in Brisbane in July, all about geospatial analysis in R. And I put up this, I put up this tweet that I tweeted out a few days before, which says, currently experimenting with using WebGL and Google Maps in R, um, but it's not working. Can someone help? And the reason I want to do this is because both Leaflet and Google Maps at the time struggled with plotting like, over like a couple of thousand points. It struggled with that. So I was exploring WebGL. But it wasn't working, and I needed some help. So at the conference dinner that night, the guy <laughs> sat next to me said, Dave, have you, have you heard what Uber are doing? No, I said. You should check it out, he said. OK, I will. Um, this is not a photo from that event. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have depicted myself as Jesus, because <laughs> Because why not? <laughs> so I looked up what Uber were doing. They, had, they have built and they are building a JavaScript library called DeckGL, which is all based around WebGL. And it uses, or it natively fits in with Mapbox. So I thought, well, I'll give that a go. A few days later, I sent out this tweet saying I've got it working. Um, it's probably going to be my next way forward. Now, can someone spot? The similarity between these two tweets, and it's not that it's of Melbourne. <laughs> Go on. Yes, Martin, down here. If you take something away from this talk, it's that Twitter-based peer pressure works on me. <laughs> I'm no peer. I can't call this. <laughs> <laughs> so then, the next few days, I just started adding more and more features, and I just started bombarding Twitter with all my more, all my updates, um, and I. Packaged it all up into a package I've called MapDeck, because it uses Mapbox and DeckGL. Released it onto CRAN, which is our central um, repository for packages. And job done. Talk over, conference finished, we can go home. But what's the biggest problem when you release code to the public? They break it. Yes, they use it and they break it. They find flaws. They, they, they find things they don't like. So on the surface, this tweet looked quite positive. He's saying, well done, Symbolics, for this. It's, it's great. Um, but can someone highlight what, why I have a problem with this tweet? About yes, about a minute. It took a minute for the R code I wrote to take the data, render it, uh, manipulate it, and send it to the DeckGL library, which is not good enough. So I scrapped everything. I, 
literally went control A on my .r files and deleted them, started again, rewrote the whole thing in C++, which turned out to be a good idea, because I got that. On my machine, it was from 70 seconds down to four seconds. Um, and what I'm going to do is to show that it's not a fluke. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm going to run a live benchmark for you now. Yes. So I'm generating a data object of a million lat long coordinates. And then I wrapped system time around the call and it did it in 1.6 seconds for me here. Now, there, there's one thing that definitely won't work. There's one thing that might not work. What definitely doesn't work is it doesn't show in the R Studio viewer on Ubuntu. It works on a Mac. You have to live with that for now. It's just conflicts in JavaScript. I don't know the answer to that. And if this loads, then the other issue is not an issue. And I'll, you can just ignore that. There you go. A million points on the map. Quite responsive. You can drag it around, move it around. Um, there we are. So I, all that code I wrote in C++ is not, I, it's not really exclusive to MapDeck itself. It can be used by uh, any other mapping library that wants to use it, because it, all it's doing now is taking our objects, converting it to JSON, so that a JavaScript library can read it. So any, any mapping library now just needs to write a JSON pass to handle the output of this. And I've made it so it outputs in the same format every time. And it's, it's a pseudo GeoJSON. I've extended GeoJSON one layer deep so that you can have multiple geometries per feature. So this will be, this is in development still. Um, I will get it on CRAN soon, um, but it's there for people to use and comment and criticize and deal with what you want. Um, one thing I found out just last week that this can do, that Michael sat in the audience here um, showing me with quad mesh data, is it can plot 3D surfaces on the map. And it wasn't supposed to handle this, but it did. And I, I'm still confused as to why it's done it. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm looking into this. Um, and I'm going to show you now a couple of other examples of where this is going. Because this map deck library is still in development, or this, the latest iteration of it. Um, so, but I've got a few things in the pipeline of what I'm doing. Um, so take these arcs. One thing I want is animation, so you can slowly animate the transition between layers and between uh, colors, weights, whatever, whatever. Um, also, I should say that these maps are all tiltable, and you can like rotate them around and see your arcs in, in pseudo 3D. Um, stop that. Next one is um, this data set is of road traffic accidents in the UK. Uh, two examples here. You can view the data aggregated together as hexagons. I like this one. It's quite cool. Um, especially, it's hard to control on a tracker pad. But it's all zoomable, it's all 3D, you can, you can go in, etc. look around. Similar thing is the grid, but what I, similar concept, I've made a, also a highlight option here, so you can highlight what you're hovering over. But what's more important for me is the speed at which it rendered that from within our, and then chucking it into the JavaScript library and then viewing it in the browser. Uh, path colors, this one, need to stop that, sorry. This is 18,000 road segments in Melbourne. And it's just updating them within under a second. You can just resample, it's just resampling the color each time I'm pressing this button. Um, so that's cool. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is polygons. These are some of the in a Melbourne. Ah, this is the other issue I was talking about. Sometimes the JavaScript gets sticky and it stays there. And I don't know the answer to that one either. So if someone knows why it does that, please let me know. Yep. Uh, another thing is you get polygons in 3D, which a lot of people will say um, is not a good idea, because what does the height mean? But it just looks cool, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, tool tips over it. But what I'm going to show you with this one is when you click on, if I grab, try and get this side by side, if you click on a polygon, you can get, you can send data back into your R session, and so you can work with that data in R, doing whatever you want, all live, like with the website running in the front ground, foreground. Um, so there we are. Yep. 
So that's the, essentially the, the polygon that's been just been plotted, and I've just clicked on it. And that is where I'm up to with Matt Vick. Um, my company one is at Symbolics AU. So that's also my GitHub handle as well. So I, yeah, I, I'll generally tweet out all my updates. Um, so follow me for the latest progresses. Like coming from like open and things like that, like your shapes and your yeah. So shape files, I'll use, um, I've written another library, GeoJSON SF, which, um, start again. Shape files, I'll use, if it's, read it in as an SF object, I then use my GeoJSON SF library to parse the SF into GeoJSON. Um, to read GeoJSON directly, I'll just use that GeoJSON library. Um, Question over here, Mark? Uh, what really interested me in, in, in knowing this talk about the previous one was your deep thinking about trying to make things performant. And, mm -hmm. and I think Duncan, when you were trying to hack the, the Google serialization of line and stuff like yeah, that, yeah. there's probably not much more time for doing that, but maybe, maybe some tricks or, or what is the most important thing to make things fast? That's a very good question. And um, do I have time to go and show this? I've got a You've got in my issues page. So to answer your question, I can't find my issues tracker that I'm tracking on, but <laughs> <laughs> I've found, depending on what you're plotting, there are different ways to optimize the data that you need to, to plot it. So um, points, if you're doing points, it works better with a data frame with a lat long column. Um, for lines, Yes, I think encoding it into a Google polyline, but stripping away all the attributes from the data object in R is the quickest way of doing it. Um, and then I'm, try I'm going to add in some arguments into MapDeck to say false is true or false. And if you say false is true, it will bypass all your data checking steps. And just assume you know what you're doing so you can just send it straight to the widget. So I'm working on the answers to that. Yeah, I'll work that. Um, I might get uh, Brad to set up while you're yeah. finishing up here. Yeah. Um, uh, one more question. Anyone else got more questions? Okay, um, thank you, David. Thank you.